Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Jason Howell and I, Micah Sargent, are back at it this time to talk to The Guardian's Carrie Paul about the new series on The Guardian, including explaining the rise of TikTok, uh, the fear of misinformation there, and uh, kind of what comes next for this very popular platform. Then Vice's Jason Kebler stops in to talk about those price hikes that have a whole lot to do with Ticketmaster. Why are events so expensive and getting more expensive over time? Then we've got my story of the week about YouTube uh, allowing doctors and individual healthcare providers to sign up for a sort of special blessing and uh, badge that says, hey, this is from a licensed healthcare provider. And then, finally, Jason Howell walks us through some of the price hikes for streaming media services and says, uh, are we going to stick around with all of these pricey, pricey platforms? It's all that coming up on Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 258, recorded Thursday, October 27th, 2022. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Dell Client Solutions Devices, orchestrated by the experts at CDW, which deliver a more personalized user experience with adaptive AI-based software that boosts collaboration wherever your team works. Learn more at cdw.com slash dellclient. And by Blue Land. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastics by reinventing home essentials that are good for you and the planet. Right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash TNW. And by Zip Recruiter. Look, there are so many podcasts out right now, and it takes a team of people to bring them together. So whether you're hiring for a podcast or for your growing business, one place makes it easy. ZipRecruiter. And now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash T-N-W. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. And when I say we this week, I do mean we. (laughs) I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. Holy moly. I'm the other guy, Jason Howell. It is awesome to be finally reunited. It feels so good to be reunited. Good to see you again, Micah. It is good to see you as well. Yeah, we've kind of been uh, back and forth on the weeks. And uh, thank you to yeah. Pruitt for filling in for one of those. That was a great 100%. episode. Uh, yeah. And I think that means it is time to get underway. Uh, our first guest joining us today is Carrie Paul from The Guardian to talk about TikTok misinformation, algorithms, and so much more. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, pleasure to get you here and talk about this. So The Guardian has put together a guide on TikTok and kind of the absolute meteoric rise of the platform. I was hoping you could start by telling us what inspired you and The Guardian to create this TikTok guide. Yeah, so we've obviously seen TikTok over the last few years just completely take off, take the social media space by storm. Um, They are surpassing a lot of longstanding social media firms that have been around for years. um, And even the ones that they aren't surpassing, everyone's trying to copy them and copy these features that are making them so popular. So we thought um, it's time to take a kind of closer look at what this means. Absolutely. Now, some folks might remember, I am one of those folks, uh, musically, <laughs> uh, musical.ly. It's the precursor to TikTok. But for the folks who don't remember musically or who aren't sure about the history of TikTok, I was hoping you could tell us kind of how TikTok got its start, where it came from, as this was part of the guide. Right. Um, And so the TikTok as we know it today is kind of the marriage of two Chinese platforms that have existed for a bit. Um, That's Musical.ly and Douyin. Um, Those uh, Musical.ly was founded in 2014 in Shanghai, and it was largely a lip syncing app. Um, It was very popular with young people, um, just lip sync videos, sing along with videos. Um, it, It got a lot of users, and then it got acquired by the technology company ByteDance, um, which kind of combined that with its existing video platform in China to make TikTok. Awesome. Now, now that it's here, uh, I often, when I'm you know going online, I, I see uh, a common 
refrain from quite a few folks who say, oh, you know, I, maybe this came from TikTok, but I'm not really on TikTok. I'm too old for TikTok. Uh, I, I don't spend time there, et cetera, et cetera. And so that kind of made me curious. And your guide helped to kind of uh, give some insight. Do the numbers line up with this statement? Is it that uh, people, I don't know, over the age of, of let's say, 26 aren't on mm -hmm. TikTok? Or are they there? Who is or what is the most common kind of age group for uh, scrolling through or posting on TikTok? Mm -hmm. Right. So with the data that we looked at, it was most popular uh, for those under the age of 30 from 18 to 29. Um, the data that we found did not factor in people between the ages of 13 and 18. You can have an account at the age of 13, which I suspect would make that number even higher. Um, it's quite popular with young people. Um, the statistics we found said that 22% of U.S. adults between the ages of 30 and 49 are on TikTok compared to 48% of adults between the ages of 18 and 29. So it definitely does skew younger, but if you are over the age of 30 and you want to get a TikTok, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed. That's good. Um, well, let's talk about one of the most common concerns when it comes to TikTok, because of course there's all the the positive uh, of, I mean, I, I certainly will when I'm, I've got nothing else to do. I can sit down and watch just hours of TikTok. Most of it's just me finding the clips that I love, downloading them and then sending them to my partner. Uh, and so I just annoy people with my uh, TikToks that I really like. But um one of the most common concerns is it kind of surrounds that when I'm looking at my for you page, I see a lot of great videos that I absolutely like. And I know that every time I choose to hit that share button, that that's informing the algorithm. So why is it that people get so bent over the algorithm and should we be worried about NyQuil chicken or I don't know what comes next? Um, Flonase uh, Easter eggs. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think the reason that a lot of people are concerned about the algorithm on TikTok is that it's one of the most algorithmically driven platforms we've seen yet. Um, you know, if you look at the evolution of social media, Facebook kind of started the game off with, okay, these are your friends. You need your little college email to sign up and you're going to add people, you know, and you're going to see what they post often in the chronological feed. Um, and then with the invention of the news feed from Facebook, which was the first, I mean, I'm not sure the first, but the most popular and the most um, influential algorithmic feed thus far, um, it really changed the game with that. And then TikTok is kind of the next generation of that where it's all algorithmically driven. You know, it, your For You page, um, which is kind of the main algorithm and what it serves you, is largely people you don't know. Um, and it's largely content that is shaped by the algorithm that it decides to serve you based on what they think you will like. And so there's a lot of concern about, you know, what that algorithm is doing to us and, and how it works. We don't really know a lot about it. Yeah, I I will sometimes hit that little follow button um, on what I'm scrolling through the For You page. But I'm almost never, because it's, what is it, like two tabs at the top. And one of those tabs is for looking at this, the people that you follow. The other one is the For You page. I honestly don't remember the last time I've gone into that I follow these people page and instead I'm on the other one. I noticed that um, it does a good job of trying to show me the videos or the TikToks, I guess, from um, the, the people that I follow first, but then it quickly goes into uh, those other ones. And so could you sp speak briefly about why is it that they think that a targeted um, algorithmically generated uh, feed has an impact on mental health? Because we hear that a lot, but what is sort of the underlying belief there? Is it uh, about exposure? Like, why is it that um, a, a tailor-made algorithm can lead to mental health issues? Right. It's, it's not just mental health. It's also misinformation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the issues that we've seen, even leading up to things like the January 6th, uh, capital riots. Um, a lot of this comes from creating these little algorithmic bubbles where you only see um, viewpoints that agree with yours. Um, the algorithm tends to surface content that's more inflammatory. Um, and so a lot of people are concerned that misinformation um, flourishes better in a more algorithmically driven feed. Um, and there are a lot of studies that say that is the case. And so there's a lot of concern about as this is the most extreme algorithmic feed we've seen thus far, what that could mean for, for what type of content is surfaced. 
Yeah, in fact, you wrote about some research regarding this specific concern with uh, with misinformation. Can you give us a few details about that research? Of course, the midterm elections are under underway in the United States, and so there's that concern. And Facebook in the past has uh, been sort of at the forefront of mi- the spread of misinformation. Uh, but what is kind of what was the research on in particular, and what did they find when it came to TikTok? Right. So there has been a new study that came out. Um, there's, it's kind of just some preliminary research because obviously um, TikTok's a relatively new platform. And, and one of the issues we have is that there's not a ton of research on it. But uh, a digital watchdog group last week um, published a study that showed that TikTok was approving 90 percent of advertisements that they created with election misinformation and submitted it to see if it would pass the test. And it passed the test 90 percent of the time. So Um, That actually was worse than some of the other platforms like Facebook and YouTube. And so researchers are concerned that TikTok is not very well equipped to shut down some of these narratives as they take off around the midterms. Interesting. Now, uh, I am curious. The Guardian, of course, has uh, published this whole guide, um, the Guardian.com technology series, the TikTok Takeover. And uh, we'll, of course, include a link in the show notes to get there. Uh, Care to share? what uh, you may continue to be writing on when it comes to to TikTok? What can our viewers and listeners look forward to? Sure. We have, um, you know, a lot of stories lined up. Um, We've already published, you know, an intro piece about the history of the platform, the misinformation issue, um, just the nature of the algorithm and why it's a concern. Um, We have upcoming stories about Um, Just the mental health impact of TikTok and how experts, researchers, mental health professionals are concerned about its impact on this really young generation that primarily uses it. Um, We're also looking a bit into the data practices of TikTok. Um, There's been a lot of concern about its data being primarily stored in China. It's a Chinese company. Um, There are a lot of politicians who think that's a security concern. Um, And we had an investigation from my colleague, Johanna, about um, the growing coyote issue on TikTok, the human smugglers yeah. who use TikTok to advertise to potential clients to bring them across the, the border. And that that content's pretty rampant on there as well. So yeah, there a lot are, of topics see, coming up. <laughs> exactly. It seems to be these kind of underlying um, ways that TikTok is being used. And you always kind of have to look at it and go, how much of this is is what is being experienced on TikTok and it's unique to the platform, how much of it is because, you know, TikTok became the most downloaded app. And so the the attention is being paid here and everything in between. I think that that's where, you know, uh, there was, there were pros and cons to the NyQuil chicken thing happening because you saw that there were these concerns that folks had about these viral challenges spreading but at the same time, it kind of resulted in a look at all of these things to go, okay, was NyQuil chicken a real thing? Was it just um, sort of some sort of fake story that was meant to kind mm-hmm. of highlight how this often happens and everything in between? And so you go, okay, this is happening on this platform. Is it also happening on other platforms? Uh, but with how popular TikTok is, I am glad uh, that you and The Guardian are looking into kind of what is happening on the platform and in particular uh, with misinformation, kind of how folks can protect themselves, as it were, and uh, make sure that they are at, at the very least aware. So we know information is power. Um Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Carrie Paul. Uh, Of course, folks can head over to theguardian.com to check out this guide and the various articles you've written thus far and more to come in the future. If they want to follow you online to stay up with your work, is there a place they should go to do that? Um, Sure, you can follow me on Twitter. It's Carrie underscore Paul. Um, I'll be over there. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, up next, some behind-the-scenes info on why those event tickets you're buying are so doggone expensive. But first, let us take a break so I can tell you about Dell Client Solutions devices orchestrated by the experts at CDW. 
as they are bringing you this episode. The people at CDW get that your unique workforce has unique needs for their devices, especially as we all continue with hybrid work. It's a challenge for IT to supply devices that can meet everyone's needs everywhere they work so that they can stay connected throughout the day. Luckily, CDW can help custom configure Dell Client Solutions devices for a more personalized user experience. What this means is that your workforce gets adaptability for performance with AI-based software that learns how your team works and optimizes workflows. And check this out. Dell Client Solutions devices have intelligent noise detection and cancellation, along with high-quality video that adjusts with your lighting. Pretty amazing, huh? This fleet of devices is really great because wherever your team works, it's built in security responds to malicious attacks, providing a secure way to boost collaboration and productivity from anywhere. When it comes to seamless experiences, Dell Systems makes adaptive performance possible. CDW makes it powerful. Learn more at cdw.com slash Dell client. All right. So if you've uh, gone to any big concerts recently, or maybe you've bought tickets for an upcoming concert, maybe you've noticed there's something maybe perhaps peculiar about the price. I mean, the price of everything is just going up. So it's kind of no surprise that we would see the price creeping up on live event tickets as well. But there's something behind the scenes that I think is really interesting about this, this story that we're going to talk about. Uh, Jason Kudler wrote about this for Vice and has some kind of background insight as far as why some of these prices are increasing. So let's talk about it. Welcome to the show, Jason. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to get you back. Appreciate your time. Um, First of all, so we've got a lot to touch on here, but you kind of, it's in the headline. You started off your article kind of focusing on Blink 182, which uh, personally, before I saw your article, I had no idea that they were getting back together on a reunion tour. So there you go. But it talk very about- exciting for me personally. <laughs> is it? Were they a big band for you? And, and you're definitely going to be there. I've never seen like. them. So yeah, uh, like many other people did not get tickets yet and am resigned to- paying a lot of money. Yeah, right. So, okay. So what is it about uh, Blink 182's reunion tour that uh, prompted you to write this article? What's going on here with the price of tickets? And what is the, what does this say about Blink 182 and Ticketmaster? So basically, yes, Blink 182, uh, favorite band from my youth, uh, announced that they're getting back together with their original lineup for the first time in like 12, 13 years, something like that. Uh, announced this big stadium tour and put the tickets on sale. Um, anyone who's bought tickets in the last few years probably has been maybe confused about what it means for tickets to go on sale because there are like rounds of pre-sales. It's like you're allowed to buy tickets mm -hmm. early if you are part of a band's fan club or if you have a specific credit card or if you subscribe to a specific newsletter. So there's really like four or five different on sales. Um, but basically people went to go buy these tickets and normally when you go to Ticketmaster, there is a set face value of tickets. It's like, okay, tickets on the floor, like in front of the stage are $80 or a hundred dollars or, or what have you tickets in the nosebleeds are like 60 bucks. Uh, but that wasn't the case for Blink-182. People went and tried to buy tickets and basically Ticketmaster has uh, implemented something called dynamic pricing, which uses an algorithm to sort of detect demand for a specific event. And because Blink-182 is very popular and hasn't played any shows for a long time, the demand for this event was really high. And so you had some people like going to buy tickets and, you know, the, the value, the, the price that they were being asked to pay was like $600, which is a lot of money uh, to see a punk band. Um, and so people were really mad about this. It's like, you know, people were making a lot of jokes, like what's my wage again, because you know, one of their favorite <laughs> or one of their most yeah. popular songs is what's my age again, uh, things like that. So people got really pissed and then I got really pissed as well because I wanted to see them and it's like tickets to see them in LA start at like $170 and go up to 250, which is not as bad as it is in other places. But last time they played in LA, the highest price tickets were like $70. And granted that was 10 years ago, but even if you account for inflation, it's like, this is far beyond 
inflation. It's like three times as expensive as it was 10 years ago. Indeed. Now, I think what um, what I found really interesting about your write up about all this is a you've got um, you've got some insight into what it means to be a ticket reseller, as you put it, which in my mind is kind of like, OK, that's a ticket scalper. Right. Like on the on the consumer side of things, how many times have I gone to Ticketmaster to buy tickets only to find out that like a the tickets are ridiculously expensive, the ones that are even remaining, the VIP seats that I'm never going to buy and right. b you know, you know, so they're all snapped up. And the only way for me to actually go to this thing is to buy through a reseller site, which is essentially fueled by all the people who went in there, scooped up all of the, the low cost tickets, let's say. And now they're selling it for more. I think what I found so fascinating about your articles, I never really considered like I'm always stuck in the angry part of that, which is like, damn it, why did they do that? You know, they're making it so that I can't go see this show without spending an arm and a leg. But at the same time, you point out that this really is kind of supply and demand, right? The the bands or the uh, the promoters, whatever, they're selling their tickets for a certain price. But obviously the public, at least to some degree, maybe not the outlandish degree that they end up being sold for, but the public, there is value there for the public to pay more because they're paying it in order to see these bands. Talk a little bit about yeah. that. So it's both like a really complicated story because there's a lot of things that go into why ticket prices are so expensive and sort of how ticket brokering works and who is mad and and how like ways of mitigating it. But it's also a really simple story in that it's straight up supply and demand. As you said, it's like there is a limited resource here, which are seats at a concert. And there are usually more people who want to see the concert than um, than there are tickets. And so that drives the price up. That drives the price up on the secondary market. And that's how, which is your stub hubs, your like seat geeks, uh, increasingly Ticketmaster is allowing people to sell uh, tickets, like resale tickets on their own site, which is its own problem. And Ticketmaster has gotten in trouble for this before, but it's like, there's both speculation going on from ticket scalpers, which you mentioned. And it's like, I agree ticket, like many ticket brokers prefer to use the term ticket broker, but to the average person, it's just like, it's ticket scalper. The reason I don't use that too much in the article is because we've gotten feedback that that's a problematic term at this point, like mm -hmm. for indigenous people or, or has Got sort it. of like an association there, but like to the lay person and traditionally people have called this ticket scalpers. And it's like, there's been an attempt by ticket brokers to rebrand as ticket brokers because it sounds less bad, but more legitimate. Time, it sounds more legitimate. Yeah. It sounds more legitimate. And it, it's like, you know, but fundamentally what they're doing is they're buying tickets that could have gone to fans and they're selling them for a profit. And these people had literally nothing to do with making the concert happen. It's like they did not record the music. They didn't release the music. They're not a roadie. They're not selling merch. They're not associated with Ticketmaster or Live Nation. It's just like, like so many other things, it's they sort of took a risk in investing in the tickets and then they're speculating on them and hoping they can sell them for a higher price. And it's like, this is a pretty sophisticated business, which I get into a little bit in the article, but no, mm -hmm. from my own experience, it's like there are company, there's many companies that do this. There's a lot of people who sort of like dabble in it as a way of making beer money. And then there's on a whole other level, there's like companies that have bots and things like this, which is a whole other part of the, the sort of ticket economy that makes people very mad. Um, mm -hmm. But basically like the ticket prices are high because there are more people who want to see the concert than there are tickets available for the concert. That is true sort of under the old system and it's true under this new dynamic pricing system as well. And we can get into like sort of what the difference is now. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, what's really, uh, really quite interesting to me is, is that, you know, you, you made the, uh, made the point that, uh, if a ticket, uh, <laughs> reseller, there we go. I gotta like reframe myself here. <laughs> yeah. The ticket reseller is selling it. That person had actually nothing to do with the concert, the music, whatever. They're just taking the money off the top. At least if it's integrated into the system and there's extra being paid, at least with this new system, one would hope because it's officially legitimate, 
that more of that money actually goes back to the artist or goes back to the people who are actually making the show instead of just lining someone's pockets who's, um, you know, like you said, just scooping up a bunch of these and hoping uh, that something comes out of it. So talk a little bit about that dynamic pricing then, because that really seems to be the counteraction to this. And is it actually making a difference as far as this activity, this ticket uh, reselling activity that's happening behind the scenes? Yeah. So under the old system, let's say tickets were priced at $50 on Ticketmaster just for simplicity's sake, but it sells out really quick. There's a lot of people who want to see a given show. It's like the tickets go on sale at 10 a.m. That's that's traditionally when they go on sale. It's like a bunch of fans get on at 10 a.m. They click, you know, I want two tickets, search for the tickets. It's like a certain number of those fans are going to get tickets for $50. Um, if you get lucky, it's sort of, you know, I've done this mm-hmm. for lots of things. Lo- lots of shows I, I know are going to sell out. It's like a popular artist, a small venue, something like that, a reunion tour. Like the, the shows that sell out are like not really a secret. It's like everyone knew that these Blink-182 tickets were going to be hard to get. Um, so let's say under the old system, it costs $50. A certain number of those tickets are going to also go to ticket scalpers or, or brokers and they're going to go post them on StubHub and the people who did not get tickets in the on sale are going to pay whatever the market is willing to, to bear basically. Mm-hmm. And that might be $100 a ticket, it might be $200 a ticket, it might be $300 a ticket. And so the band and Ticketmaster are still making you know the fees and whatever the... Um, this sort of uh, margin is on that original $50, but the rest of that value, the rest of the profit is going to the ticket scalper. Under the new system, dynamic pricing, Ticketmaster is sort of anticipating using some algorithm that we don't know all of the inputs, but presumably include like historic ticket sales combined with Spotify plays combined with uh, sort of the genre and the last time the band played and so on and so forth to basically predict what the ultimate price people are willing to pay on a ticket is. And so instead of pricing that ticket at $50, they're pricing that ticket at $200 to begin with. And in doing so, they're sort of like cutting out that excess value, excess value that is being captured by the ticket resellers and, and, basically everyone is paying that price. And so instead of having a handful or even a majority of fans who are getting tickets for $50, everyone is sort of paying that scalper price more or less of $200. Um, And this is nominally like not necessarily a bad thing, but I can understand why people are really mad about it because all of the people who would have paid 50 bucks because the tickets were sort of fundamentally underpriced for what the demand would have been are now paying that $200 and presumably a large portion of that is just going to Ticketmaster. It's like Ticketmaster mm-hmm. fees have been a thing that people have complained oh. about for a really long time. Um, but it's like now, now Ticketmaster is, just, is capturing all of that and presumably like some of that money is going to the band, which is a good thing. And it's specifically a very good thing considering the pandemic and the fact that like, two and a half years of live shows have more or less been canceled. And that's been really hard on bands, but it's also been really hard on bartenders and roadies and merch sellers and sound guys and so on and so forth. So it's like, in theory, that should be more money for everyone involved in putting the concert on. The big question is like, all of these things are extremely tightly held industry secrets. And I don't have any reporting on how much of this sort of additional price is actually going to the band and how much of it is going to Ticketmaster and whether any of that is trickling down to like sort of the working class people on these, on these things. So ostensibly it's like, it's, I think it's a worse system for fans themselves because everyone is paying a higher price and no one can sort of like get lucky and get inexpensive tickets, but it's better for bands. Um, if the bands can sort of withstand the negative publicity that comes from everyone being mad that it costs at least $200 to go see 
a band that had its heyday in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and you also later in the article talk about Garth Brooks, who has a different strategy here uh, that I actually like a lot because I, th- I think I uh, think in the end, if a band is willing to do what Garth Brooks has done, then the band seems to make out you know pretty pretty well uh, because they're selling tons of tickets and the fans seem to make out pretty well because they're paying a lower cost talk a little bit about that that yeah so basically garth brooks um has a system where he just keeps adding shows until in a certain city until everyone who wants to see him has the chance to see him so for example like he'll play omaha and he'll announce one concert and that show will sell out in a few minutes because garth brooks is really popular And, you know, the ticket brokers will buy the tickets and try to resell them. But the second it sells out, he'll just add another show the next day. Um, Mm -hmm. And he'll do that until the show stops selling out, basically. So he play he'll play like seven nights in a row in Omaha or something like that. And this has a dual effect, actually, of like, basically, everyone can buy face value tickets, but it also screws over the scalpers. Um, And the way that it screws them over is like, they are speculating on and buying tickets and expecting to sell at a profit for something that ultimately like the market, the secondary market drops out because there's so many tickets available. And the way that he makes so many tickets available is he like, I'm just going to play shows until my tickets can't be sold for a profit anymore. And it's like, he's Garth Brooks. So he can do that. He can do uh, that I think yeah. it, for a lot of other people, it's like, you know, are they able and willing to play seven shows in a, in every town that they run through? It's like planning a tour is really complicated in many ways. It's like you have to make sure that, you know, the, the nightclub is open on that night, like that they can schedule you and so on and so forth. And it's like a lot of bands can probably sell out like one show, but they wouldn't be able to sell out a second show. And it's like maybe the 930 club in DC doesn't want this band to play five nights in a row. Um, but for someone like yeah. Garth Brooks, or I think Blink-182, it's like Blink-182 has added a couple of shows. And I think adding shows and just like uh, increasing the supply of tickets that way has been one of the most effective ways of combating scalpers. Yeah, interesting. What this, I'm realizing what this reminds me of is uh, earlier this year, I had tickets to see Paul McCartney, kind of a bucket list item for me. I was like, you know, I, I got to see Paul McCartney. I got to see one of the Beatles before he's no longer touring. Finally got the tickets and everything. He added a second show here in the Bay Area for a Mother's Day show. And I ended up getting COVID earlier that week. Our whole family did. So I couldn't go to the show. I basically had to give the ticket away. Like there was no way for me to like, you know what I mean? I'm I'm not a ticket reseller, but I was in the position where I had this ticket that I thought was valuable. And essentially I had to take a total loss on it in order to just find someone to go, which is amazing when you think about it uh, for someone like Paul McCartney. So, you know, it's got a lot of like a myriad kind of trickle down effects as far as all of this is concerned, but I'm fascinated by the topic and I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing your insight on this um whether people like it or not if you want to watch a you know go see a concert you're probably going to be spending a little bit more and i suppose the the benefit or the positive there uh it, it, you know if, if anyone is looking for that is hey if you like your artists hopefully this means that more of that money is going to them but i'll be looking forward to the reporting that actually proves that because i'm super curious about that as well uh if Jason, you have any uh, any top secret documents uh please find me <laughs> I'd love to see them. <laughs> there you go. Find Jason Kebler at uh, vicevice.com. And actually, if they want to DM you with that information, where, where can they find you? So I'm at Twitter, uh, Jason underscore Kepler. My name is right there. Um, I also, my signal is on Twitter. So right on. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks so much for Thank you, Jason. Me. Yeah. I hope you get to see Blink 182 this time around. I hope it happens. <laughs> I will. I'm going to pay too much, but I will. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. yeah, make it happen. Sometimes it's just worth it to pony up uh, for the experience. So, all right. Take care, Jason. We'll see you soon. All right. You too. Thank you. All right. Up next, uh, Micah's story of the week. We're going to transition into our stories of the week. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Blue Land. Uh, did you know that an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away every year? Just visualize that. Like 5 billion of anything is a huge amount. And then every single year. And if that's not bad enough, most cleaning formulas are 90% water. And what does that mean? It's heavy to ship. 
It leads to excessive carbon emissions as a result. All of that water being shipped all around, it's kind of unnecessary. Plus, those products are often filled with nasty ingredients, things like chlorine, ammonia. So all around, it's a lose-lose situation for you, for the planet. Uh, so if you ever feel overwhelmed by the number of plastic bottles and containers that you're throwing away, um, maybe you've thought or considered uh, purchasing more eco-friendly products you didn't know where to start or maybe you've tried a few green products you found them pricey ineffective well if you answered yes to any of these questions uh you need to check out blue land blue land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastics by reinventing home essentials that are good for you and good for the planet blue land's innovative tablet refill solution takes up 10 times less space than a traditional bottle and their powerful formulas keep your home clean, keep it smelling amazing. And the idea is really simple. You just get one of their beautiful forever bottles. These are bottles that you know are meant to be kept forever. That's why they call them a forever bottle. I have a hand soap dispenser. You know, it's made of glass with just a high quality plastic pump on top. Not meant to go in the trash when you're done. You're meant to keep these things. You fill it with warm water, drop in a single tablet, and then it kind of does the work for you, right? You're adding the water in instead of that being shipped with that water. So that's reducing carbon emission uh, accumulation there. And you can get to cleaning. Uh, refills start at $2 and you don't have to buy a new plastic bottle, like I said, every single time you run out. You can even set up a subscription so you never run out of the products that you're using the most. And you can save even more when you actually buy in bulk. Cleaning sprays, hand soap, toilet cleaner, laundry tablets, all Blue Land products are made with ingredients you can feel good about. Like I said, we've got the hand soap dispensers throughout our home. We've got the house cleaners like the sprays, the disinfectant sprays, all those things. Those containers downstairs for when we're cleaning the house, and they're just high quality. They're not that flimsy plastic that you buy at the grocery store and then throw in your recycle bin and hope, cross your fingers, that they actually get recycled when they're taken away. Because we know like that <laughs> sometimes it's not as easy as just putting it in the recycle bin and it gets recycled. No, no, no. Uh, you want to try Blue Land's Clean Essentials Kit, which has everything you need to get started. Blue Land products come in a refreshing uh, array of signature scents, things like iris agave, fresh lemon, eucalyptus mint. For a limited time, their hand soap is getting a fall upgrade because we're right in the middle of fall right now. Three refreshing new scents, apple butter, vanilla chai, maple pumpkin with... <laughs> You don't want to eat this stuff, but it really sounds delicious, honestly. Uh, <laughs> right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash TNW. That's 15%. Save 15% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com slash TNW. Check it out. You're going to love this stuff, and you're going to wonder why you waited uh, as long as you did to hop on board blueland.com slash tnw and we thank blue land for helping the earth uh, one day at a time and we thank them for their support as well of tech news weekly all right micah over to you for your story of the week yeah so we were talking about misinformation on social media earlier and i saw a pretty new report out this morning as we record this show um about youtube uh so I didn't realize this, but YouTube uh, a while back set up a system for uh, both healthcare. Um, let's see, what is it? Healthcare groups. Uh, so I'm trying to find it now. I've lost it. Uh, there are certain groups of healthcare professionals that were able to uh, be part of this program. And, here we go. Organizations like public health departments and hospitals were able to access these special features that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, but these features have expanded to more, uh, which basically allows for a kind of, it's a, it's a, akin to the blue check on Twitter, uh, but I would say even more, um, more vouch <laughs> vouchy powerful yeah sure <laughs> vouchy <laughs> uh vouchy it's more vouchy because um with the the way that it was set up before basically these um health departments and hospitals had to prove that they were health departments and hospitals and in doing so then the videos that were put out had kind of a badge or a mark that said hey this is from a licensed group or this is from uh, a hospital and so this information you know you can count on it being at least 
accurate under the bounds of what is uh, public health. So now, uh, as of this morning, this has expanded to include licensed healthcare professionals. So that could be doctors, it could be nurses, psychologists, marriage and family therapists, and social workers, uh, this from The Verge, are able to apply uh, to have their content verified uh, by way of sharing you know, their licenses. And Along with this, I like this, it says, uh, and again from The Verge, I quote, they'll have to agree to follow the best practices for health information sharing created by the Council of Medical Specialty Societies, the National Academy of Medicine, and the World Health Organization. So those guidelines kind of surround the fact that the um, the content that they choose to share needs to be objective, it needs to be transparent, uh, it has to be based in science. And if they agree to that and their license is verified, then they will get kind of a, a special badge that shows that their content is uh, part of this program, labeled as reliable. And then also their contents can be fed into different areas on YouTube's website where it's specific to health. So you would go to YouTube and you would see a whole section that's like healthcare um, or you know similar services. Again, these include therapists, social workers, et cetera. Uh, and I like this because it's a difference between unvouched medical uh, conspiracy and health conspiracy or vouched for uh, medical science. And importantly, I think what I like uh, the most about this is that YouTube says that it's not like uh, once you get in, you can start to make content that has all of this. And then uh, for now until the end of time, you are able to put this out. Um, the people who become part of the program will be reassessed uh, periodically so that, uh, you know, YouTube can make sure that it's still hold that, that the medical professionals are holding up to uh, the agreement that they made. Um, so there's this whole process for applying, uh, and so it includes, let's see, applicants who meet our criteria will be eligible for information panels for health source context and, uh, health content shelf. And so the health content shelf, again, is an area uh, that you can see on YouTube that is related to health, uh, in particular, and especially if you were going through and, you know, you're searching for a particular health, um, topic then you will see the shelf of content that comes from this, uh, as well as those information panels. And here I want to go through some of the um, minimum requirements for eligibility. Uh, first, you have to attest to the health information sharing principles. So those are what we talked about where uh, the CMSS, uh, the NAM, and the World Health Organization have these principles on uh, info sharing regarding health. You have to be licensed in uh, either a licensed doctor, a licensed nurse or registered nurse, a licensed psychologist or equivalent, licensed marriage and family therapist or equivalent, licensed clinical social worker or equivalent. And they use the service called Legit Script um, that does the license verification. So whenever you go to apply, uh, you will use that um, platform to be able to make that. And then you, this is... On top of uh, that verification, you, uh, of course, have to follow YouTube's channel monetization monetization policies. So you've got to follow YouTube's own rules regarding content. Uh, have to have more than 2,000 valid public watch hours in the last 12 months. So you do need to be um, not, I, I would say, not incredibly popular because in one year, 2,000 hours of people watching is not a whole lot. Um, mm -hmm. but popular enough. Your channel can't just be that every once in a while you publish uh, a YouTube video on health. Your The primary focus of your channel needs to be health. And then you have to have no strikes against you from the community, from breaking the community guidelines. Uh, once you do, then there is a place uh, where you can join by going to health.youtube because yes, Google is a top level domain uh, provider and therefore owns the top level domain dot YouTube. Uh, so mm. health.youtube. And then it takes, um, this is interesting, one to two months for the verification process to take place. Uh, so they take quite a while to um, 
review and make sure that everything lines up. And then it says accepted applicants may become eligible to start surfacing and select features in early 2023. Uh, so it is not, you know, you want to, if this is your thing, you want to get in on it now uh, because it will take some time for the verification process. And you also will have to wait until um, the next year for this to start to roll out. Uh, but right now, as I said, it's for uh, health groups and hospitals. But if you're an individual and you want to make use of this, uh, then this is the process for doing that. Um, it says to channels with pre-existing standardized vetting mechanisms, such as accredited hospitals, academic medical institutions, public health departments, and government organizations don't have to apply for this because they were already uh, sort of verified on previous grounds, as uh, we talked about there. So they will not have to kind of do extra work to be able to apply. Uh, but I think this is neat to be able to have these... Um, these health product features available to individuals. I do see some of the most popular content on YouTube on the rare occasion that I'm on the site uh, does seem to come from different healthcare professionals. So being able to go, okay, this person is confirmed a licensed doctor at the very least. And then they also have to follow these guidelines as well. Um, I think that's interesting. But what I am most looking forward to when it comes to this is how this plays out in terms of who doesn't end up getting approved and if they end up kind of becoming you know notable uh in that way so what i mean by that mm. is inevitably there's going to be a news story in 2023 about some doctor who didn't get approved and what the process what the reasoning is behind why they didn't and i have to be honest with you like it's probably going to be for the best that they weren't approved, but I want to see kind of how this process works because who within YouTube, within Google, within Alphabet is in charge of that one to two months process of vetting a, uh, you know, the licensed healthcare professionals and their channels. What are their credentials? Um, how many people are looking over this? What happens if a person tries to apply and can't get it? Uh, do they get to reapply? Um, what will result in someone losing that verification? Uh, because this is such a small group in the overall scheme of things, I don't know how much we'll get to see, but this almost makes me wish that I was a, some sort of licensed healthcare professional just so I could apply for the process and see what it was like. Um, and more importantly, as I said, the I think it's going to be fascinating seeing how the process works and who ends up not making it through and whether they're given reasoning for why they aren't uh, allowed to go through. Because um, they even mention in uh on blog.youtube, which is YouTube's official blog, uh, Dr. Mike, who is probably one of the most well-known um, or among the most well-known YouTubers, uh, I, you know, that individual who makes lots of videos, being able to have that content there and then go, okay, this is a licensed professional. At the same time, it's not just someone dressing up in a doctor coat and saying, right, well, right. you should take these pills. Uh, I think that's going to be a better thing overall. And more verification and more vetting i i really like um and i think it's been proven out in some ways uh we've seen early studies regarding twitter's own misinformation uh system called birdwatch actually doing what it's uh i think people were even surprised that it's actually working uh birdwatch is a platform is a, a sort of set of features on Twitter where people can fact check uh, tweets and then provide context or include links. Uh, I applied for that program and have been a bird watcher for quite some time now. And essentially what happens is if I see a tweet that says something, but maybe is being taken out of context, or I feel like there's some misinformation involved with it, uh, then I can add context to that tweet by saying, okay, this is what the tweet says. Here's why it may be inaccurate. Here are some links to sources that show that it may be inaccurate. These are trusted sources, uh, you know, straight from the World Health Organization or straight from this or straight from that. Um, I, there were a lot that I did right around the time that monkeypox was starting to uh, mm. 
become more well known. And uh, it had, you know, there were lots, there's lots of misinformation obviously surrounding that. And then other bird watchers can vote on the helpfulness and the overall quality of a specific note that's left on a tweet. And then if it gets enough uh, sort of thumbs up, then it will be viewable by the general public. And so people were able, are able to see, okay, this is what the tweet says, but here's some context on why that tweet may not be accurate. Or you can even provide context for tweets that are accurate. If folks are saying, well, this isn't true for this reason, you can say, no, 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 it is. And here's where it goes back. And um, early research on that shows that the birdwatch thing is actually working because uh, tweets with birdwatch notes were not getting as much... Um, uh, sort of spread engagement spread uh, due to the bird watch notes. And there were some other um, sort of uh, ways that, you know, when it was getting quote tweeted or what have you, then there was context provided then in the quote tweet itself because of the bird watch notes. So mm. I think that this kind of thing can be effective. Um, and I'm glad that YouTube is paying attention to that as well, because YouTube is yet another platform where we are watching uh closely for problems with uh misinformation spreading and it's a platform that a lot of people like when it comes to our health you know something something happens youtube is a place where a lot of people go to find an answer for things so it's really important that's that happens to be a very you know popular place for people to go to find these medical these answers to you know uh complicated medical situations that are happening in their lives and they're just you know in some ways we're just kind of trusting the one that comes at the top of the list versus having a system where it's like okay yes you're getting this answer and it's coming from someone who has been vetted vetted by whom that's a really great question micah you know like what is that vetting process uh really you know start to finish like the thing that kind of comes to mind for me is you know there are some doctors out there who are anti-vax and you know so what is what is the qualification what what is the the clearing system to ensure that you know that that certain views on on vaccinations don't go i guess a step too far right and what is that too far i i'm really not quite sure i'm not qualified to answer that question <laughs> right but, but i do think that having a system in place for something like this is a really smart idea yeah it really also reminds me of kind of verified on twitter even though verified is really a lot less um you know yeah, says, you don't have says to a have lot a less license. about the person yeah. than this says about you know the source that it's that it would be marking for so yeah i'm for it i like that i am as well uh you know what else i'm for i oh, don't know i'm gonna guess <laughs> it's zip recruiter <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's right that's right <laughs> uh zip recruiter of course is bringing you this episode of tech news weekly uh, there are a lot of podcasts out there right now. You may have heard of a few of them. <clears throat> you know, Tech News Weekly, one of those. Uh, but you might not know that it takes a special team of people to help bring it all together. Uh, some of you doing more than one job, but you've got engineers in some cases, editors, producers, and they are all working their darndest to bring you the episode that you've got. In fact, here at Twit, we've got multiple people doing multiple jobs. Uh, our engineer, Burke, uh, he makes sure that the guests who join the show sound and look good. Um, we have these little scheduled calls that the guest does with Burke before the show happens. And Burke says, okay, adjust this this way. Uh, click these buttons to turn on and off uh, these features in our Zoom or whatever uh, calling service we're using. Uh, oh, the the EQ is off. We need to modulate the. I, look, I'm you know I'm making things up uh, because that is not my job. <laughs> if without Burke, then the people wouldn't sound as good as they do. They wouldn't look as great as they do, uh, or at least come through as great as they do. They all look good, uh, and of course, then we've got editors and producers who, in the case of Tech News Weekly, 
got John Ashley. Oh, and also technical directing the show as well. Uh, he is behind the scenes right now showing you this page uh, from ZipRecruiter. He is also the one who makes sure that uh, all of the text that we have for the show is put in place. He makes it so that uh, the video is edited properly. And so if we have awkward, uh, really long pauses as I try to do an intro to a sponsor, he might take that out. He might leave it in. Who knows? All of that happens because of uh, our awesome team. So needless to say, hiring the right people for these roles is important. And whether you're hiring for a podcast like ours or for your growing business, ZipRecruiter can help. ZipRecruiter's technology finds the right candidates for your job, and you can invite your top choices to apply. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter Four out of five, that number, my goodness, get a quality candidate within the first day. Yes, I said day. So if you're a fan of this podcast and you want to try ZipRecruiter for free today, you need to remember our special URL, ziprecruiter.com slash TNW. Once again, that's ziprecruiter.com slash TNW. ZipRecruiter the smartest way to hire. All right, Jason Howell, tell us about your story of the week. Kind of, I guess in some ways my story of the week has a little something to do uh, in a small part, I guess, with the interview that I had with Jason Kebler from Vice. Really has to do with kind of the economy and where we're at with the price of the things that we're paying for digital goods, right? In that interview, uh. it was really about ticket prices going up. But now I thought I'd talk a little bit about subscription service prices, because I'm sure you all have noticed in one way or another, you know, maybe you're only subscribed to one service. Maybe you're subscribed to a bunch of them. They're all following a little pattern right now, and that is that the prices are going up. So I thought I would um, kind of compile a little bit of this. I did some homework to kind of pull in uh, all, you know, some of the main services that we use to kind of see what's happening with those prices. And we can kind of talk a little bit about how that's impacting us personally um, uh, in a few minutes. But first, let's walk through what we know about these price increases. Uh, first, the facts. Back in March, you may remember Netflix, um, which, by the way, is a company used to raising its monthly rates. This was the fifth time in seven years that they've done so. So not a big surprise. They bumped up to $20 uh, for their highest tier 4K plan from $18 prior to that increase. The basic plan went from nine to 11. So in all these cases, it's really a couple of bucks. Its standard tier went from 1550 uh, to, oh, well, that must be a typo because that did definitely go up. It didn't go down to 14. I must have, uh, I don't know if that's 17. Sorry, I, I may have typed in the wrong number there, but... We have a new ad supported tier. This I know for sure rolling out. Mm -hmm. You probably heard about this seven bucks next month. And if I'm totally honest, I could completely see that jumping to nine ninety nine if the economy continues to go down uh, the road that it seems to be following right now uh, at some point. But basically what you're seeing is, you know, seven bucks kind of replacing what, you know, was the basic plan ish. You know, it's close to what the basic plan used to be. Um, uh, not too long ago. So there you go. Disney Plus and Hulu, uh, they announced in August, so just a couple of months ago, some pretty steep increases. Disney Plus increasing its monthly cost from $8 to $11. Again, we're talking two to three bucks for the increase here. So that starts December 8th. So that's right around the corner. Disney Plus is also about to launch an ad supported tier. So again, we're seeing this little trend, uh, which Hulu, which we'll talk about in a second, seemed to really kind of do this much earlier than the rest of the, you know, the services are. But this ad supported tier of Disney Plus, once it launches eight bucks a month, which is the old standard price, right? Disney Plus. Uh, monthly cost just raise, is raising from eight to 11. So this is like replacing the $8 tier. You could stay at eight bucks. You're just going to have to get it used to ads as a result. Hulu's ad free tier, uh, that's ad free, no ads, jumped from 13 to $15. Again, another couple of bucks uh, that happened this month. Uh, and like I said, they've had an ad supported tier for a very long time. You could call them a trendsetter in this department. Uh, that plan jumped from eight to nine dollars this month so now we've got an ad supported tier closing in on that ten dollar amount 
Uh, not to mention their bundled costs have all increased. I won't go into all those in detail, but if you're bundling, yes, you're saving more by bundling, uh, you know, versus paying for them individually, but still that bundle cost is going up. ESPN plus jumped from six ninety nine to nine ninety nine, So from seven to $10 back in July, it's another $3 there. Apple, uh, increasing its subscription service costs as of earlier this week. So this is relatively recent news here. Apple TV Plus goes up by $2 to $7 per month. Kind of crazy that Apple TV Plus has only been $5 for us uh, since it launched back in 2019. That's been a that's been a deal. Uh, Apple Music increased its monthly cost for single users by only $1 to $11. $2 increase for families. That's up to 17 bucks a month. And then I imagine, are, do you do the Apple One bundled cloud services thing, Micah? Yeah, I do. I, uh, the Apple One plan that has kind of, it's, it's like Amazon Prime, but for Apple. Yeah. Um, right. It, it seems to be the most cost effective way to make sure I have access to all of the services. Yeah, yeah, it has all of that roped into one. It's going from fifteen to seventeen dollars for individuals, or if you got the family plan, uh, twenty to twenty three dollars. And that's that right there is kind of a trend, right? We've also got YouTube only boosting the the cost of YouTube Premium's family plan. So if you're a single user, you're not seeing a cost increase. Although I'd really be surprised if that doesn't happen at some point. But YouTube Premium family plan is jumping. And not just by a little, it's a 25% increase from $18 Oof. a month all the way up to $23 a month, which is on par for what Apple One is offering uh, for all of its bundled cloud services uh, for you know the same cost, $23 after, um, after its increase. And then, so these are all the, the video services, right? We haven't even talked about uh, audio and music. Spotify, of course, is the big player when it comes to music, I'd say the biggest in the room. They haven't raised their rates yet. In fact, and I thought this was kind of interesting. I didn't realize this. It's been a decade that the price has been at $9.99. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose thumbs up to Spotify for keeping things locked in there at $10 a month, but... There was just a, an earnings report. It was pretty strong, but CEO Daniel Ek noted uh, that, yes, it's competitors, Apple, YouTube, they're all increasing their rates. And as a result, Spotify is now looking into its own rate hikes. So you can uh, be on the lookout for that. And then Amazon Music is still going for nine bucks a month. Back in February, they raised their prime monthly rate from 13 to $15 per month. Um, still in some ways, I'd say, you know, possibly the biggest value of almost any service, you know, with all those added prime benefits, you get video, you get music, you get so many things looped into there. Um, but it's, you know, it, it just raised and I'm sure we'll see that raise again. So, uh, so I don't know how, how is this impacting you? I know for mm. me, we've got Netflix, we've got Amazon prime. We've got Disney Plus slash Hulu, but I think that is kind of like our Disney Plus subscription is is looped into, God, I feel like we have another service that it just like came with for like two years. We got free service. So, so like when that goes away, we'll have to ask ourselves, like, do we actually want to continue paying for this? I don't know. I mean, you know, these things at two to three bucks a time, if you're subscribed to a few different places, it adds up. What about you? Yeah, it's funny. I was just talking about this yesterday. Um, yesterday on my show, Clockwise, uh, someone had asked a question about sort of our streaming service stuff as of late, and it made me realize I, I hadn't like it was a subconscious thing, but not quite a conscious thing, which is that I have reached the cap on how many streaming services I'm willing to pay for. And so yeah. if one were to come along, I would swap out because I've done that already. I think within the last couple of months, there was a show that I wanted to watch and it was on stars. And so I ended up giving up something else so that I could watch it on stars. Um, because I thought I'm not going to pay per month for yet another uh, streaming service. And I I think I already have, you know, it feels like too many with Netflix, with Hulu, um, with, I can't remember now, what are the, what are the other ones? Oh, of course, uh, Apple's Apple TV Plus Apple, as part of yep. the, the, the Apple One. And then uh, Amazon Prime, Prime Video as part of my Amazon Prime subscription. And there are so many, but they, with these price increases, it's like, 
it's hard um, when it comes to price increases uh, for non-physical stuff in particular, because it's like all of this time I've been able to get this thing for this price. And now you're changing the price, but the service is still the service that it is. I, you know, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't add up in that part of my brain. I understand the the sort of need to increase prices to continue to offer content to create new content, et cetera, et cetera. But when I look at it from my perspective, and I imagine uh, when others are looking at what they're going to keep, what they're not, it's the same service, but now suddenly you're charging me this much more i know that these different streaming services are going we need to do this but how much more we charge and when we choose to make that change all of that stuff kind of has to weigh heavily on them so that they don't lose because if you hike the price but then it causes you to lose a bunch of subscribers excuse me then does mm -hmm. that mean that you are actually making more money. And so some choose to raise the price by quite a bit, as we've seen, because they know they will lose people. And so they need to make it up with the people who stay behind. And I was uh, I was actually during the podcast, someone in the chat room had said, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these streaming services end up switching to, you can only subscribe to a year as opposed to month by month. And oh I thought about it and it's like, I, you know, I think that would be hard for a lot of them to do, but perhaps some of them would because what people end up doing is I subscribe for a month during the time when my show comes or I wait for my the show that I want to watch. I wait for it all to be out. Then I subscribe. I watch it that month and then I unsubscribe because I've gotten mm -hmm. the show that I wanted to see. Churn. And yeah. yeah, the churn. Exactly. So all of this makes it's got to be difficult. And, I, you know, we continue to see uh, different sites uh i my disney plus isn't uh bundled with something but i know that um i've got i think it's paramount and some other service they i got some bundle through that and then i know i get hbo now through my at&t uh my phone plan uh because of the phone plan that i have and so there are all these little bundled services because they're trying to uh make it so that it still remains cost effective in our brains <laughs> mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. and it doesn't work whenever we're just trying to choose piecemeal because you know 6.99 a month but then five ninety nine a month, and then fourteen ninety nine a month, and then twenty four ninety nine. All of these add up, and we see them on our bills, and we go, "Oh, actually, I've only watched uh, two episodes of a show on this service. I don't need this anymore, or yeah. I only kind of liked this show anyway, so I don't need to keep this around." Which is what I did whenever I swapped out the one for the other. So yeah, yeah. it's it's hard to justify all of these uh, price hikes from my side of things. I understand and even agree with the justification from their side of things. You know, it's not enough to just say, oh, they shouldn't do this. They kind of, within within reason, they kind of have to. And yeah. so I they're understand why They're beholden to their is. shareholders, you know. Exactly. To, to they're beholden to their shareholders. more and more money. How do you do that? <laughs> and not only are they beholden to their shareholders, but in the case of, um, you know, if they are producing their own content, they're beholden to uh, the studios that make it and the actors who are in it and the deals that they have to make there. I mean, you know, Netflix pumping out a bunch of content by buying it. I understand why all these price hikes are happening. And if they feel that they're losing money from people sharing accounts or what have you, I also see why the price needs to increase there. Uh, it's just the value has to outweigh. And I think that uh, for me, and this is where I'm curious about you, um, if Netflix raised their prices, I would continue to pay for Netflix because I watch a lot of stuff on Netflix. Um, if Hulu raised its prices, the one good thing about Hulu is that it it does have a lot of different networks on it uh, or content from different mm -hmm. networks on it. And so it, it does seem valuable. Um, but I think I canceled my Disney Plus because I don't watch much stuff on there. And if, um, I don't know, Paramount Plus uh, raised their prices, I would cancel it. Is what's the service for you or services for you that if they raise their prices too much more, you'd say bye bye to? Would Netflix uh, continue to be on your list? 
I mean, Netflix has been the stable, probably the stable streaming service for me. But um, yeah, it's really hard because it's not just me, right? Like it's the kids. And I know that the kids find a good amount of stuff on Netflix versus me. I don't really find a whole lot on there anymore that I'm that excited about. Mm. I, I would almost be inclined to get rid of Netflix personally. Um, but I know that I would kind of much rather the kids watch stuff found on Netflix than I would them just watching mindlessly on YouTube. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> I mean, I will say one thing is that, um, and this is somewhat related, uh, totally impacts what we're talking about here though, is that, uh, not too long ago we switched over because the, the YouTube music was just driving me insane and there was some compatibility. We got a, a Tesla, um, model Y, you know, a few months back it didn't really have a built into the dash version of YouTube music. It's just Spotify that's on, that's added there. And mm -hmm. boy, how effective that product placement or that service placement is because once we realized how great the integration is of Spotify with the whole dash system, we ended up, you know, just getting the family plan on Spotify. And at a certain point we were like, okay, well then why are we also paying for YouTube music and YouTube premium? Of course, what we got out of YouTube premium was ad, ad free YouTube, but we're, we don't watch a huge amount of YouTube. I do because of what we do, you know, for a living, but everyone else in the family, you know, we're always trying to cut it down for the kids. My wife doesn't care about YouTube. And so we kind of got rid of that and, mm. um, so, so, you know, so that's another service that, uh, you know, that, that we did get rid of and I'm still trying to figure out because now I'm watching ads anytime I go to try and, and, uh, watch, you know, one of our episodes to make sure that, you know, it's, it's up, uploaded yeah. properly and everything. I got to wait like 30 seconds for an ad. I'm like, Oh, this just really <laughs> sucks. After years of not having to do that, this actually sucks. But, um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, and a year ago, I would have probably said that I will never get rid of YouTube premium because ha having no ads in that experience was worth it. But even that's going up at a certain point. It's like, how much am I willing to spend per month to not see ads on a platform that I use sometimes? And, uh, yeah, I guess my answer to your question would probably be Netflix. I would get rid of Netflix. I, I really don't watch it much anymore. Um, but at the same time, really at the end of the day for me and for I think a lot of people, it is, you know, it all goes back to churn, which is the fact that the system, the services are set up in such a way now that the consumer has a lot of flexibility and a lot of choice to be able to say, look, I don't need all these services every single month because I only have so much time that I can use to watch. But there's nothing stopping me from canceling this service and signing up for that service and spending the next couple of months on that service, doing all the, the Disney plus things or the Apple TV plus things, and then canceling that and moving over to here and scooping up their stuff and enjoying the, the series over there that I've heard are really good. And there's nothing stopping us from doing that right now. You mentioned the idea of mandatory, like yearly subscription plans and, oh man, that would just really suck. Because yeah, that would just suck. I don't want that to yeah. happen. So, <laughs> but costly. I could see why they do that. I could totally see it. Yeah, it, it would keep you keep you locked in. Um, I, I will yeah. say the one place where that works for me is apps. Uh, with apps on my phone, um, the yearly subscriptions tend to not be too pricey. And because I'm using them regularly, then it is worth the cost, you know, to spend $20 and have it for a whole year versus the $2.99 a month or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but yeah, yeah, these services would be very expensive if I paid them yearly, like I do with Amazon Prime. Um, I don't pay that month to month. But yeah, if Netflix went yearly, um, I would that that would be it would be a harder pill to swallow. I'd be like, oh man, this feels like even though if I do the math, you know, it adds up, but I don't think of it that way. Right. So that it's like no, oh, no. Drop and I think a lot. I think that would actually spot. turn a lot of people off if if Absolutely. it was mandatory. That would one hundred percent turn a lot of people off. You know, maybe it ends up being like. Well, I mean, they probably already offer this where if you do, I mean, do they, if you buy a year, do you get a discount on the yearly cost, uh, on the monthly cost? If you buy a flat year in advance, you know what I mean? Cause then there's incentive yeah, yeah, yeah. to do it, but yeah, I don't know if they actually do that. I don't think Netflix offers anyway. yearly. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe that's the next step. It's kind of like, that's kind of like an interim. It's like, okay, you can continue paying your monthly. That's a little bit more than it has been ever. Um, or you pay it all upfront for a year. We know we've got you locked in and that's worth X number of 
percentage off the the monthly plan you know a lot of services do that i just don't know if the video services do that right now but oh and anthony in our slack is saying he thinks hbo has a discounted yearly i mean this is a pretty standard kind of approach i'm really mm -hmm. surprised if they don't do that right now that's one way i think it should be both yeah right now i'd love it if all of them offered a year option and then maybe yeah. on some of them i would take it maybe um but mm -hmm. I don't think that, uh, you know, only offering a year would do it. I've seen a few no. try to do like three months or six months or something like that um, mm -hmm. to get people to stay around longer. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anywho, you're going to be paying more, no matter how you slice it, for services and everything else, because welcome to the economy as we are right now. Uh, but that's it for this episode of <laughs> Tech News Weekly. Uh, to leave you on a light note, sorry about that. We publish every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. That's where you can go to subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. Jump over and subscribe. We'll see you there. Please do. And if you would like to help support uh, the network in these trying times where subscription services are getting more expensive and uh, tech companies are cutting back hiring and in some cases uh, letting go of some of their staff and uh, advertisers are saying, we aren't ready to uh, be a sponsor just yet, but may in the future, we just got to see how the wind blows and where the ocean takes us, uh, then help us out which you can do by joining Club Twit. For seven bucks a month uh, at the minimum, you can get every single Twitch show with no ads. And the reason why I said that is because we just uh, offered the ability, if you would like to, we, had, we heard from some folks who were like, seven bucks a month, that's it? For all of this stuff, we think that you deserve more. Well, now we've given you the option to pay what you want, starting at seven bucks, uh, eighty-four dollars a year. And when you do so, you get access to those Twitch shows with no ads, the exclusive Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else, and access to, I think, a great part of the uh, program, the members-only Discord server. That is a place where you can go to chat with your fellow Club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit. Uh, great place. Uh, check that out. Twit.tv/clubtwit. And when you do, this is where we talked about, uh, you know, I said before, if something is the same and then they start charging more, it's like, what? Um, you, we're still charging seven bucks, but you continue to get more as we add more to the club. Now you can get access to the Untitled Linux show, a show, as you might imagine, about Linux, access to mm -hmm. Hands on Windows, which is Paul Therott's show. Uh, where it's a short format show that's got tips and tricks regarding Windows. And then my show, Hands on Mac, where I've got tips and tricks regarding all of your Apple devices. Uh, I've got one going out later today that talks about editing and unsending messages using iMessage. Uh, and yeah, still available for seven bucks uh, to start. And if you'd like to contribute more and help us out, you want to keep Twit going and rolling along, that's how you can do so. Uh, so please check that out. Twit.tv slash club twit. If you'd like to follow me online, uh, I'm at Micah Sargent on many a social media network, or you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Uh, check me out Thursdays for Hands on Mac, of course, as well as Tech News Weekly. Uh, Saturdays on the radio show Heard Round the World, The Tech Guy. And on Tuesdays for iOS Today. Uh, where Rosemary Orchard and I talk all things Apple. Jason Howell, what about you? Yeah, well, you can find me at Jason Howell on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on All About Android every Tuesday, twit.tv slash AAA, talking about the Android operating system and behind the scenes producing a bunch of shows for Leo as well. Uh, big thanks to John Ashley. Thanks to Burke. Thanks to Anthony for uh, pitching in in the Slack for the content of the show. And thanks to you for watching and listening each and every week. We could not do this without you. And we'll see you next time on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, editor-in-chief of Ad Astra Magazine. And each week, I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists. And sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space books and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time.